When I was seven, my father started beating me. It went on till I was about 13. And what I remember the most from the beatings was not just the physical aspect of it, getting punched, kicked, hitting with a belt, but the part I remember that I couldn't protect myself from was my father yelling at me over and over to be a man, to act like a man. Uh, I would never ever show emotion to anybody. I would never let anybody know how I was really feeling. Uh, and when I finally did open up in, in my early 40s, it was a river uh, that just drowned me. My mother, uh, instead of sticking up for me, ran around the house closing the window so the neighbors wouldn't uh, find out. Uh, that was pretty, uh, then I realized I had nobody I could rely on. But I got abandoned by my wife when I was a senior in college. I married a French girl I'd met in Europe when I was going to school. Uh, we had a baby and a year later she was gone. So I got abandoned again and this time I got abandoned with a son. Years later I got married again and had a second son. Uh, when he was 29 he died uh, suddenly from uh, pneumonia. Uh, I felt like I'd been abandoned again. Uh, so I think the abandonment was way worse than the violence. The sense of being abandoned never really went away. 20 years ago, I started a men's group with some of the angriest, loneliest guys I'd ever met. I wanted to start another group to show the power of men sharing their stories. So on a Saturday, I sat down with a group of men who'd never met. Our one objective was to be open and honest about our lives. This is what happened. You know, I thought my childhood, I thought it was only me. I thought it was, you know, I thought everybody else out there had, you know, because the Brady Bunch was on when I would come home from school, and I would see that model, and I thought, you know, I'm putting my parents to bed at night, you know, because they can't get up because they're passed out, or, you know, they're screaming at each other, and I'm protecting my brother, and I'm cooking meals, and I'm doing laundry, and I'm like eight, nine, ten years old. And I, you know, I know there's worse, but I became the mother and the father in the household, and that, uh, that's carried on with me. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm probably a bit of an enabler because I just want what's best all the time. And to my own detriment, or to the detriment of people around me, I will try and make everything all right. This is when I'm four, I want five, six, seven years old. So he loved leather straps, because uh, we had horses and they happened to have, you know, reins and there was always plenty of leather around. Um, so he would hold us by one arm. I mean, it was not necessarily, you know, um, any one of us, but, you know, he'd hold us by one arm so he couldn't get away and then just pretty much wield the, yellow, the, the leather straps. And um, So I just remember being absolutely terrified of my father all the time. And, you know, I realized it doesn't take much to terrorize a, a six-year-old kid, you know. Mm -hmm. um, because there was another time, my brother, younger brother, had a bicycle. No, he had a paper route. And um, he uh, worked and worked and worked at that paper out, and he earned, I think, $27, enough to buy himself a bicycle. He had this money that he had earned, and we went down, and we went to a, a store downtown and uh, found a bike that he liked. So he used his own money, and he bought the bike, and he uh, brought it home. And he hadn't had it for more than a day when my dad saw it. And he said, where'd you get this bike? He said, well, I bought it with my paper money. He said, who gave you permission to buy a bike? He said, well, I thought I could do it because, you know, I earned the money and I thought I could do it. You can't have that bike. I have the bike. It's my bike now. And he took the bike. Oh, man. <laughs> my dad was John Wayne, uh, you know, we didn't talk about feelings. Uh, he was bucked up, you know, you pulled up your own boots, bootstraps and get it done. And, you know, what goes on behind the white picket fence wasn't, wasn't uh, abnormal by any means, but it was just kind of that, that hidden thing, you know, men and, and your, our family, we didn't talk about our feelings. And, you know, this is not what we did. So I was in the Navy and I met a little Wahine stationed in Pearl Harbor and uh, thought I was in love. I think I was in love. And, and uh, we got married. I had a stepdaughter. She had a daughter from a previous. And my son, who was born while we were in Florida, was just a little over a year. I came home from work one day and the house was cleaned out and she was gone. This was just a few months after, mm. after, uh, after they had started contact again. 
And she was a great mother. She was a great person. We got along well. I still don't fully understand what the fuck happened there. I just, she left the kid, though. And she, well, she had him for a couple weeks, wow. and then I ended up getting him back because I hadn't really done anything wrong. It was in my junior year when I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. Oh. And uh, they said, well, I said, well, I, you know, I can't get an operation tomorrow because, because uh, I've got tests. You know, this is finals week. He's like, you dumb shit. <laughs> this is testicular cancer, and this is the 80s. And, you know, you, yeah. you're, having, you're having an operation tomorrow, and then we're going to get really aggressive because you have a 5% chance to live. And my son was about, you know, three or four years old. And that, you know, that really, uh, he kept me going. You know, yeah. because yeah. I couldn't be concerned for myself in any way, shape, or form. And I'll never forget, you know, throwing up over the toilet for hours and hours and hours. And here's this, this three-year-old boy sitting there just like rubbing my back. Oh, man. Uh, just <clears throat> some powerful shit, you know. I mean, it, and to think that somebody could be there at that level for me emotionally as a three-year-old, as a four-year-old, yeah. is just a trip. And, but it also put me in a mind frame where I, I, can't, I can't be concerned for myself. I can only be concerned for myself because I need to be concerned for him. Right. When I was four, my mom divorced my real father, who was in Utah State Penitentiary for life, um, and married even a worse guy. Uh, he molested all of our family members. Uh, raped me when I was a kid from the time I was four until I was about 13 years old. I was scared to death to come home from school. I was living my life um, terrified, literally terrified to go to sleep, uh, terrified to come home, terrified to go out, um, and I didn't know where to turn to. Um, had nothing to turn to. My mom tried taking us to church, and you know I played the routine, God, if, if you're a real God, stop all this horrible shit, mm -hmm. and it never stopped. It never stopped. It kept going on and kept getting worse. You know, you're just a piece of shit. You'll never amount to anything. Um, and here's a good sock in the stomach for you or slap across the face or, you know, throwing you around in a sleeping bag until you smash into a wall and knock you out. That kind of crap. You know, to this day, I, I don't trust men. Um, this is a huge journey for me even to be sitting in this room with men talking about this. Um, uh, men to me have always been evil. Um, I, I inherently thought that I was going to be the evil person that, you know, I was raised by. Um, so I didn't want to have kids forever. You know, I, I just thought, no way, because I was going to be passing on this, this evilness that happened to me. <clears throat> so I got into the drinking. I put all the energy I could because the drinking took away the hurt. Well, um, about three years into my Navy experience, my real father was out of prison for a while. And, uh, Decided he wanted to come and meet up with me and say hi, and I was home, and that fucked me up. <laughs> I went AWOL. I actually mm -hmm. deserted. I was gone for more than a year. I just could completely just fucking. <laughs> I've been on the search, you know, for. I've, I've tried to go through this progress and say, well, you know, I'm not going to hang on to my childhood. You know, I'm not going to be the person, this is what's happening to me because of what happened to me. You know? Um, and so I denied it. So I feel shitty about myself. Oh, here you go. You are what you've been told. You're a fucking failure. When I was seven, I remember uh, getting packed off uh, into a car with my father. Um, and I thought we were going for a ride. And we ended up two hours later at a YMCA camp in New Hampshire in the middle of nowhere. And I'm just seven years old and puts me out of the car, puts my suitcase down and says, see ya. And I, I, I cried like a baby. I was seven. He totally abandoned me. My father was real free with his hands. And uh, when I was about nine, uh, he was chasing me around the house. And I knew what would happen if he caught me. So I ran into the bathroom and I locked the door. And he was banging on the door and I was watching the dust come out of the screw holes and in the, in, in the, in the clasp on the door. And he was trying to get the knob, uh, door knob to open. And I knew he was going to break the door down, and I couldn't jump out the window as a second story because I thought about that. And so I said, if I let you in, do you promise you won't hit me? He said, yeah, I promise. So I unlocked the door. He came in. He beat the shit out of me. So that was my second lesson was trust. You know, here's a guy who abandoned me, and here's a guy I couldn't trust. Well, that was a pretty fucked up way to grow up uh, when you can't trust the people who you're supposed to 
That's where, as men, we learn to trust first from our fathers. That's the first guy in our lives. If he's not trustworthy, then no men are trustworthy. And I've heard a couple of you guys already talk about how you don't trust men. Well, I didn't need 